encourage you to get a Bible and let's follow along. We're going to do a textual study from 1 Peter chapter 5. So I encourage you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. We'll be spending our time there in that chapter, drawing our points from chapter 5 of 1 Peter. Base our study on a phrase found in verse 1, so let's see what verse 1 says. The elders who are among you I exhort, who am a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Paul is, or Peter is writing to brethren, exhorting them to live holy, which is what the book is about. The whole book is about living holy, even as he is holy. We saw that in chapter 1 verses 15 and 16. But in this chapter, he is exhorting to greater holiness, but he starts on the note of addressing elders, though there are things in this verse that doesn't apply only to elders. But he identifies himself as a fellow elder, as a witness of suffering, but he also identifies himself, this is Peter saying, that he was a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Talking about the hope of heaven, how do you know that? Well, I know that because this is the glory that will be revealed, not the glory that has already been revealed in the sense that he's experiencing the glory of salvation, the forgiveness of sins, and the glory of a fellowship with God, but he is a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Do you consider yourself a partaker of the glory? The New Revised Standard Version translates that one who shares in the glory to be revealed. In other words, if you have the hope of eternal life and I have the hope of eternal life, then we share in the hope of eternal life. And so Paul, uh, Peter pictures himself as a partaker of that hope of eternal life. He moves from the sufferings, which is the subject under consideration at verse 1, and also for, throughout the chapter, and even previously in the book, he moves from the sufferings of Christ to the glory that shall be revealed. I am a witness of the sufferings of Christ, but he moves from that to talk about the glory that is to be revealed. And so Peter identifies himself among those who share in the hope of the glory of heaven. Would you consider yourself a partaker of the glory? Interesting phrase. Not just one who has the hope of eternal life, but I'm a partaker of the glory that is to be revealed. So let's talk this morning about partakers of glory. 1 Peter chapter 5. And we're going to look at the entire chapter and see what it has to say about being partakers of glory. If I were to ask for a show of hands, and I'm not going to, but if I were, who among us wants to be a partaker of glory? I think every hand would go up. Let's ask again, who doesn't want to be a partaker of the glory? I don't think anyone would raise their hand and say, I don't want to partake of that. I don't want to be a part of glory. I don't want to go to heaven. So every one of us wants to be a partaker of the glory that's mentioned here at verse 1. Four things we want to consider. Here's the first. Let's consider how partakers live. If you are a partaker, you're going to live like this text describes. Remember the theme of the book has to do with living holy in all of your conduct. So without going any further, we could stop at verse 1 as if we had read all of chapter 1, chapter 2, 3, and 4, and read just verse 1. I don't have to go any further, I know this much, that if I want to be a partaker of the glory, then I need to be one who lives holy. But what does he say here in this context? Well, first of all, I want you to notice that partakers of glory are people who live humble. Look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Now we'll come back to the rest of that phrase in a moment or the rest of that verse and the next in just a moment. But notice he says, be clothed with humility. Now what does that mean? In other words, what does humility mean? What is humility? Well, let's get some definitions of what that means. The same word is translated lowliness in Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 2 and Philippians 2 and in verse 3. So it is this idea of bringing ourselves down rather than exalting ourselves up above others. It's bringing yourself down. Lowliness is how it's translated in other texts. Look at verse 6 now. It is the opposite 
of being proud, verse 5 and 6. God resists the proud, verse 5 says, but gives grace to the humble. There is a contract. So it is the opposite of being proud. In other words, humbleness has to, or humility has to do with not being haughty, not arrogant, not placing yourself in preference above others. Now then we're going to see how that works here in the context in a moment, but we're continuing to define it. Bedag says it means humility or modesty. Now typically when we talk about modesty, we usually are using that in the context of our dress because that's how it's used in 1 Timothy chapter 2. But it's a much broader term than that. This has to do with your view of yourself and then there's a specific application made in 1 Timothy chapter 2. So here is a reserved view of yourself. One who is quite flamboyant and they're arrogant and they're flaunting their characteristics and they're flaunting themselves is not modest. They don't have a reserved view of themselves. So I know what modest, uh, uh, humility means. Let's talk about the degree that is described in this context. How much humility do I have? Some could have a little measure of humility. Come, some could have deep humility. What's he talking about in this context? Well, notice he says at verse 5, be clothed with humility. In other words, not a mere trace. There are some people that you might could describe, well, I've, I've seen some traces of humility. I, I've seen some evidence at times they're humble, but I don't know that I would describe them as being clothed with humility. In other words, they're completely enwrapped and enclosed in that and surrounded by humility. The text says the degree to which we're to have is being clothed with humility. Now that word clothed means the idea of tying on. Lowell and Dida says, their lexicographer, that says it means to dress, that word clothed means to dress oneself with the implication of clothing which is tied on. Now that's interesting. It's not just a garment that's thrown on that may easily be taken off, but this is a garment that is tied on. And Peter may be reflecting on something he had seen the Lord do. Do you remember in John 13 when Jesus washed the disciples' feet? Remember that occasion? He got up and girded himself and tied on an apron, which means he tied on a symbol of humility. He's going to serve. And we'll see my service at verse 5 here in just a moment. But it's the idea of tying on. It's also tied on in the sense that you're not going to lose it. He's going to keep it on. Imagine if you're going to be running or if you're going to be out in the wind and you put on a garment that you don't want to be, to be blown off or to easily be snatched off of you. You may tie it on or you fasten it so that it stays on. Here is humility that you tie on. You intend to keep it on. It's not a trace that you're merely reflecting for the occasion, but you're not really humble. The degree is we're to be clothed with humility. But here's another question. How do we show humility? You say, I want to be humble. I, I want to be what this text talks about because I want to be a partaker of glory. But how do I show humility? This is not something you do as a false sense and a pretense that you've displayed before someone. There are things you do found here in the context. Like what? Well, let's look at verses 1 to 4 and verse 5. Verses 1 to 4 have just talked about leaders or elders. Then verse 5 talks about our relationship to them. That's part of the humility. So let's see verses 1 to 4. What did he say about elders? Elders in the sense of 1 Timothy 3, who are appointed to lead. He said, I exhort you, he's also a fellow elder. He says, I tell you to shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers. They're the ones who feed, they're the ones who oversee. There is some degree of leadership and authority. Not by constraint, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over them. That is not with a strong iron fist you lead, but you lead with, with character, but as examples to the flock. Now then let's drop down to verse 5. So we, we say, okay, what we saw in verses 1 to 4, here's elders, here's their job, here's their role, they're overseers, but what's my role as one of the members with reference to that? Go to verse 5 now. Likewise, you younger people, now let's talk about who the younger are. I don't think he's talking about young teenage folks. Now, you younger need to do this, but now if you're older and you're mature, you don't, this doesn't apply to you. Younger in contrast to the word elder mentioned in verses 1 to 4. Generally, they're older men who are leading and who've met the qualifications of maturity. So he's saying those who are younger in contrast to the elders, what do you do? Look at verse 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. 
That is a statement of humility of submitting to leadership. So how do I manifest that? How do I show that? I show it by submitting to those who are leaders. But let me footnote, as I often do in Bible class, let me stop and footnote here just for a moment about this church. Going through all of this pandemic that we've gone through, quite often the four elders here have received commendation from you all. We thank you so much for the leadership that you've provided. We thank you for leading us in the right direction and the, the harmony and the unity that's gone on during this pandemic of how everything has gone. I want to tell you, it's not the elders. It's because we've got a group of people who know how to submit and how to follow leadership who are humble people. It's the congregation that's made that go smooth, not the elders who made it go smooth. That's what's worked. It's because we've got people who, who serve and work with an eldership who meet this quality here is why we've got a good church. You can have good elders, but if you don't have people who are willing to follow, you don't have anything. You've got to have people who are willing to follow. We've got a good congregation who are humble. That's why our things are going well. That's why things are going smooth through all of this. It's the congregation who's meeting this quality right here. But there's another quality that manifests this humility. Chapter 5 in verse 5b, second part of verse 5. It's the same principle found over in Ephesians 5 in verse 21, and that is submitting to one another in service. He said, yes, all of you be submissive to one another. Now, I don't think he's saying by that that, yes, we're to submit to elders and their leadership, so we need to submit to one another. I need to submit to you, and you need to submit to me. We might have different leadership qualities there. No way you can submit to everybody in following their leadership. Same principle of Ephesians 5, 21. Submit to one another in the fear of God. You submit in serving one another, taking care of one another, what their needs are. So when someone is in need, you take care of that. You see what their needs are, and so you submit in service. There's another thing found in this context that's a manifestation of this humility, and that is trusting enough to cast your cares upon God. Look at verse 7. Casting your cares upon Him. You say, well, He shifted gears. That's not what He's talking about. Let's, let's, let's come out of verse 5. Be clothed with humility. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, undo, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. Now, the next phrase, connected with that. Connected with that. Casting your care upon Him, for He cares for you. Part of humility is, is back, backing up and saying, God, I can't handle all of this, and I'm going to bring this to you for you to handle. It has to do with living free of worry and anxiety, as American Standard translates it here. You see, if, you, if you're just filled with anxiety, maybe it's over this pandemic, maybe it's over the election, and you just, you're just beside yourself. You can't even rest because of that. And you haven't taken those matters to the Lord. You're not humble enough to say, I can't handle it. I'm going to turn it over to God. Be humble and take it to the Lord. Don't be filled with anxiety. Even in the midst of suffering, this is the context. Where they are being persecuted for their Christianity. And so rather than being anxious over that, knowing you might be beaten, knowing you might be threatened, Cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. This may be alluding to Psalm 55, which was the, the psalm of the sore distressed, as one author put it. Where in Psalm 55, he made a very similar point of bringing your cares before the Lord and casting them before the Lord and letting him deal with that because you're not able to handle that. Hamilton Well said in his comment here at verse 7 that what we learn from this is it matters to God what happens to Christians. And so humility means I carry my, my burden to Him, my concerns to Him, the things that have gotten me uptight. I take them to the Lord and I cast them upon Him and I leave them there, and that's part of my humility. How do those who are partakers live? They live humbly, the text says. But that's something else we need to ask about, and that is, why do I need to do that? Why do I need to be so humble? Because verse 5 said, God resists the proud. God rejects the proud. That's a quotation from Psalm of Proverbs 3 and verse 34. Because God will reject you if you're not humble. Secondly, God exalts the humble, verses 5 and 6. Notice what he says. But God gives grace to the humble, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. So why do I need to be humble? Because God will reject me otherwise. Because remember, I want to be a partaker of the glory, and I want to be exalted 
And furthermore, notice at verse 6, when I realize how small I am before God, that brings me to that point of humility. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. When I realize how great God is and how insignificant I am in comparison, Isaiah 40, by the way, that brings us to that point of humility. Here's the second thing now. We're still talking about how the partakers live. They need to be watchful, verses 8 and 9. Look at verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is walking about his roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Come back to verse 9 in just a moment. First of all, he said, be sober. Those who are partakers are going to be sober. Certainly, that would include being free of intoxicant, but that's not really under consideration here, though it would be included. The footnote in the New King James says to be self-controlled. The New International translates that alert. Be alert. Chapter 4, verse 7, same book. Back up to chapter 4, verse 7. Be watchful in your prayers. The same word watchful is translated sober here. It means to be watchful. I like this definition from BDAG. BDAG says it means to be free from every form of mental and spiritual drunkenness. He's not talking about it being intoxicated with liquor. It's not what he's talking about here. Free from every form of mental and spiritual drunkenness from excess passion rashness confusion to be well balanced self-control have you ever seen someone who in their their thinking pattern they're just not balanced they're erratic they're, 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 they're running with passion here and excitement there and they're never settled they're more excited than being watchful yet there's some things going on that concern them but or excited and running in every direction, like I don't know what to do, rather than being settled and balanced in self-control. Lowell and I said it means to be in control of one's thoughts and process and thus not be in danger of irrational thinking, to be well composed in mind, balanced in your thinking. Be sober. Verse 8 says, be vigilant. Be sober, be vigilant. What does that mean? The English Standard says watchful. New American Standard 95 says to be on the alert. Vine says it means to be spiritually alert. Be awake. Keep your eyes peeled. As if the same kind of thing, if you thought there's danger lurking outside, you probably wouldn't go to sleep, but you got your eyes peeled and you're watching outside and you're looking for danger. It's the idea of being watchful. You're spiritually alert. What I'm learning from this is by casting our cares upon God at verse 7 doesn't mean we don't have anything to do. When we talk about taking our cares and casting them before God and leaving them with God, that doesn't mean I'm not doing anything that I sit back and not doing. I need to be watchful now. I need to be sober. I need to be vigilant. Now, why do I need to be vigilant? Go to verse 9. Or verse 8, rather. Why do I need to be vigilant? Because your adversary the devil walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. See, we have an adversary. That's an opponent in a lawsuit. It's the devil. An opponent in a lawsuit is out to get you. They're out to defeat you. The devil is not our friend. He's our adversary. He's roaring, which means he's fierce. He's not a pet. He's as a lion. He stalks. And he destroys and he walks about looking and seeking whom he may devour. In other words, it's not that he will devour you if you get close to him over here. And so don't get in the cage with him, but there's no danger of him. He's walking about looking to see whom he may devour. So the devil is looking to see, is there something I can do to get you? Is there something I can do to get, is there something I can do to get you? How can I tempt you? That's why we need to be sober. That's why we need to be vigilant. So what do you do? You say, what do I do about that? What do I do? Look at verse 9. Verse 9 says, resist him steadfast in the faith. You know, set yourself in opposition and fight. Some who become a part of Christianity say, I, I, I love peaceful circumstances and I don't like to fight. Well, then you're, not, you're in the wrong army because you've got to be fighting against our enemy, our adversary. We've got to fight. Set yourself in opposition and I'm going to fight him. And you do it with a steadfast faith, verse 9. Resist him steadfast in the faith. 
But there's some encouragement for the battle according to verse 9. Verse 9 says, notice, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by the brotherhood in the world. The same persecution, the same opposition, the same temptation that you're facing is faced by every other brother and sister in the Lord. You're not in this by yourself. That's some encouragement in the battle and in the fight. Now, I know how partakers live. We're talking about partakers of glory. Here's the second thing. Let's talk about what partakers become. There are four descriptions given at verse 10. But may the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you've suffered for a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. This is what partakers become. I know how they live. The text just told me. But what do they become and when they live that way? Well, first thing is they're going to be perfect. Perfect. That doesn't, in fact, the term is never used with reference to flawlessness. I don't think you'll find anywhere in all the New Testaments. You may find one, but I haven't found it yet. Where the term perfect is ever used with reference to flawlessness. And so quite often we say, you know what, I'm, I'm not a perfect Christian. Well, what you mean by that is I'm not flawless. There, there's, you know, I'm, I'm subject to, but we need to be perfect in this sense. And in every sense in which the Bible talks about being perfect, like Matthew 5. Strong says here's what that means. It means to be complete thoroughly. That is repair or adjust. It means to fit or frame or mend or make perfect or perfectly joined together to prepare or to restore. Sounds like a bunch of disjointed uh, comments. We're going to tie them all together in a moment. The same word is translated mending with reference to mending nets. Remember when the disciples were mending their nets? It means there were holes in their nets and they're trying to fix the holes and patch and make them whole again. Same word. God wants us to be mended. Well, the same word translated restore, where those which are spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. The word translated restore, same word translated mending, is translated perfect in our text here. Getting a picture here. Vincent says the radical notion of the verb therefore is adjustment, putting all the parts into the right relationship and connection. That is, there may be things that are not fitting well in my life and making them fit together in the right connection, making adjustment as necessary is what's involved. Making repairs as necessary. So here's what I'm learning from that. Partakers will be complete. Here's what partakers become. They become complete. That may be that you've had to make some repairs and mend it. But you are complete now. You, you, you were the net that had holes, but you're mended now. You may have been restored. You may have gone away from the Lord, but you've been restored to the Lord, and now you're complete. It may be that you've had to work to put all the pieces together in your life. Because that's what perfect means. It means pulling it all together in the right pieces and in the right relationship. And you might have had to make some adjustments along the way. Because as you're becoming a Christian and becoming stronger, you realize, you know what? I don't need to be doing that. I need to change a little bit. I made adjustments. That's what this means. We're making adjustments along the way. But here's the second term at verse 8. Established. Here's what those who are partakers become. They become established. The word means to confirm. English Standard so translates. Lord and I, and I says it means to strengthen, to make firm. It's translated strengthen in Luke chapter 22. Let's go back to that just for a moment. Remember, the Lord told Peter, I pray for you that your faith fail not. Remember that? But when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. Same word translated establish here. I want you to establish your brethren. I want you to strengthen them. One author says, to give, give you firmness is how he translated that or they translated it. May be expressed negatively in some languages as will cause you not to change in your faith. That's the establishment. Or will cause you to trust less. In other words, I want you to be so strong that you're not going to shift and change in your faith or trust God any less so that you don't cast your cares upon him, verse 7. So here's what partakers will be. Partakers, here's what they become. They're going to be firm and they're going to be unmovable. That's why you're a partaker of glory, verse 1. Here's something else. Strengthen, verse 10. Here's the third of the four. What does that mean? Lowell Nada says it means to make more able 
to strengthen, making persons more able to engage in or undergo certain experiences. Now get that picture. You see, all these sound like the same thing, per per perfect and established and strengthened, but each one has a little different connotation. The idea of strength and loyal not to say, it means to make able to engage in and undergo certain experiences. It denotes the idea of God giving them strength to bear all the sufferings without wavering in their faith. So here's what that means. Partakers have the strength to endure whatever challenges come to their faith. That's why they're still partakers. So you say, I, I want to be a partaker. Well, I know how I'm supposed to live, but what am I going to become if I'm a partaker? If you're a true partaker of glory, you're going to reach the point, you're strengthened so you can handle whatever comes your way. Whatever battle comes, whatever winds blow, whatever challenge comes up, your faith will withstand that. Here's the fourth thing. Settled, verse 10. Established, English Standard, New American Standard 95 says, the NLT translates it, and he will place you on a firm foundation. The International translates that steadfast. Vincent says the radical notion of the word is, therefore, to ground securely. And he cites two cases, like Matthew 7, where the house is founded upon a rock, firm foundation, in other words or the laying the foundations of the earth, which obviously were firm. So here's what I'm learning. Partakers stand on a firm foundation. They're, they're not building on the wrong foundation. They're standing on a firm foundation. So Paul said, here's, or Peter said, here's what you become. If you're a partaker, you're going to be complete, you're going to be established, strengthened, and you're going to be on a firm foundation. So I know how partakers live. And I know what they become. I believe we're going to need some help along the way. Because that's a big, tall challenge. So let's talk about some things, some help we find right here in this context. What help do you partake? If you're a partaker, you've got some help w with this job and this challenge. What kind of help do we have? First of all, there's the God of all grace. Go back to verse 10. Interesting phrase. Verse 10. But may the God of all grace. He's not just the God, but he's the God of grace. But not just the God of grace, he's the God of all grace. Now, how does God help us in this per, as per the context? Well, verse 10 says, he called us to eternal glory. He's inviting us to eternal life, which means he wants us to be saved. He is not a God who is a gotcha God. I'm looking to see if I can catch you. And if I can catch you in a wrong, then I've got you so you don't go to heaven and I'm out to zap you if I can find you doing something wrong. But he's wanting you to come to eternal life. He wants you to be saved. He's on our side. Look at verse 10, verse 12. If he's the God of all grace, and he talks about the true grace of God, verse 12, then he provides grace, things that we don't deserve. You say, I don't deserve to have the hope of eternal life. Well, who does? Who does? But he offers it to you anyway. And then I want you to notice at verse 7, you cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. He cares about you. You say, I need some help. This, this is a tall challenge. I don't think I can do this by myself. Well, I'll tell you who's on your side. God's on your side. He's the God of all grace. He's providing you grace. He's out for you to be saved. He's out to help you in any way he can. Here's another help we have. Elders, verses 1 to 5. Some think of elders as merely those who make financial decisions. Or they may think of them as people in authority who have power and authority. The biblical picture of elders are those who are watching for your souls. They're there to help you. Here's what they do as per the context. They feed you. Shepherd the flock of God, verse 2. Elders who are doing their job are feeding the flock. Not just the one who may speak. He may or may not be an elder. But what goes on in the pulpit and in the classroom, that's the elder's responsibility. That's on their shoulders. If you're not being fed, they're to blame. They're to see it's being done. So they feed you, making sure you've got the right diet so that you are a partaker of the glory. When churches are fed the wrong diet and they become weaker and weaker and weaker, it falls on the shoulder of the elders because they didn't do their job. So elders are doing their job, are there to help us because they're feeding us. Verse 2, they lead us. They feed us and they lead us. They're the overseers. It 
more responsibility than it is authority. Is there authority? Oh, yes, there's authority there. Responsibility like a parent. The parent has authority over the child, but it's a greater responsibility to see they're guided in the right direction. And something else they do, they show us, serving as an example according to verse 3. What I'm learning from this is that partakers have elders who are watching out for their souls, Hebrews 13 and in verse 17. The point of Titus 1, which I'll not take the time to develop, is that God placed elders in the church to, to guard and protect sound faith. So you say, I need help. God's going to help. Elders are there to help. But I'll tell you something else. There's fellow Christians mentioned in verse 5, verse 9, verse 14. You see, there are those who will help and encourage one another. That's the point of verse 5, submitting one another. Be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. We serve one another. Verse 9, we're all going through the same thing. We've already talked about that. Verse 14, greet one another with a kiss of love. They're fellow Christians who show their love to one another. Don't just have love, but they let it be known. They display it and they show it. Now you think about what that means. When there's the God of all grace, there's elders, there's fellow Christians, and then you add to that at verse 12, the revealed word of God that encourages. Look at verse 12. He said, I have written to you briefly. That's the revealed scripture. That's the writings. That's, that's what you hold it. I've written to you briefly, what did you do in this writing? Exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace in which you stand. What's he talking about? He gives them assurance of what's true through the written word. I'm on the right track. I wonder if I'm living right. Well, I can read the scriptures and I know if I'm living right. I wonder if the doctrine I believe is right. I can read the scriptures and find out if it's right. Reminds me of 2 Peter chapter 1. The next chapter as it folds in your book. 2 Peter 1 is about the like precious faith is true. The things on which you stand and the things that you believe, the things you've been taught, indeed are true. One more thing in the lesson is yours. Let's talk about number four. The hope that partakers possess. I know how they live. I know what they become. And we've got help mentioned right here in this chapter. But by the way, if we're talking about being partakers of glory, that means we possess some hope. What about the hope that partakers possess? Let's go to verse 1. There is hope that we share with others. It's what we have in common. Go back to verse 1. Partaker of the glory. Also a partaker of the glory. There were others who were partakers, Peter is saying. There's others that are partakers. But I consider myself as a partaker or sharer with that. He mentions in verse 4 this hope. He pictures it as a crown. In other words, a reward. To receive after an effort that's been put forth. Look at verse 4. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. Two things I noticed from that. Number one, that's going to happen when the Lord returns. You don't receive it beforehand, but you'll receive it then. That is, you'll receive it when the Lord comes, at the second coming of the Lord. And this is a crown that does not fade away. This is a reward that doesn't fade. Have you ever been given something that you were just thrilled that you were given that? Maybe it's a gift. Something very valuable that was given to you. And then over time, it just kind of fades, tarnishes, discolors, loses its value, and it's not worth what it once was. It doesn't have the luster it once had. Not this reward. Never loses its beauty, never loses its worth. Look at verse 6. What we're hoping for is to be exalted. Humble yourselves therefore into the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. And then finally, verse 10, he calls this eternal glory. Now I know what he's talking about at verse 1. Partakers of the glory. What are you talking about, Peter? Verse 10, God called us to his eternal glory. This is eternal life where we will live and never die, where life never ends. Partakers of glory. Are you a partaker of glory? Peter considered himself a partaker of glory, he said. I'm also a partaker, he said. That was the wording he used. 
And in the context, he talks about how partakers live, what partakers become, help partakers have, and the hope partakers possess. Are you a partaker of glory? If you're not a Christian, you're not a partaker of glory. If you haven't been obedient to the gospel, you're not a partaker of glory. If you have been obedient and you've fallen away and become unfaithful, you're not a partaker of glory. Would you become a partaker this morning? Would you come believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Would you repent of your sins? Would you acknowledge your faith? Would you be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins? If you're subject in any way, would you come while together we stand and while we sing?